It's time for your daily LSU baseball update with Musso at the box. Now, Matt Musso. And welcome into another edition of Musso at the box. LSU, they're looking to bounce back after dropping that weekend series. At Mississippi State, they will welcome in in-state foe Louisiana Tech to Alec Box Stadium, Skip Burtman Field on Tuesday night for a midweek tilt. And it's a very important game for LSU. We're not going to sugarcoat it. And I'll also tell you this. It is the perfect test for LSU coming off the weekend that they are coming off of. So for that reason, I'm very fired up to watch them play this game. I will explain why it's the perfect test the further we go throughout the show. So we'll look at the matchup. We'll look at Louisiana Tech. We'll tell you what we're watching for. We'll go through the starting pitching matchup. All those things we normally do on the preview. And, you know, uh, I'll also say this. I I wish they were playing on Wednesday night because there's still so much that I wanted to talk about with the starting, with not just starting pitching, with the pitching staff in general. uh, But, yeah, we'll, we'll sprinkle that in throughout the week, obviously, before we get, uh, you know, to Florida. So we have plenty of time to do that. We'll focus in on Louisiana Tech, and we'll even sprinkle some of the pitching staff thoughts in here because it it I mean, it plays into this game. It, it, it matters a, a whole lot. So uh, smash the like button if you have not already. Get subscribed up to the YouTube channel if you have not already. Subscribed up on your favorite podcast app as well. Moose with the box. Very, very much appreciated. All right, let's dive right into it here, shall we? Um, Start with your overview on Louisiana Tech. The Bulldogs make the trip down from Ruston. They are 16-5 and overall in the season, coming off a weekend sweep of Northwestern State. La Tech got off to their program best start, 12-0. They won their first 12 games. They then split a midweek uh, series with Xavier before Xavier came down to the box. Uh, the Musketeers won that final game of that series. So that was LaTeX's first loss of the year. They followed that up by losing a series at home to, uh, excuse me, to Southern Miss and then would lose a midweek game to ULL. So before that three game sweep they had over Northwestern State. Uh, They had dropped five of six, but very much got back on the right track. They hit 309 as a team. They have a team ERA of 465, and they field 977. Very complete team, and that's what we're going to get into here momentarily. LSU leads the overall series with La Tech 45 to 20. That's your overview. Let's jump right in now to your starting pitching matchup. LSU, this is a pretty easy call for the Tigers considering you did not see him at all over the weekend in Starkville. And uh, that's going to be, excuse me, that's going to be junior lefty Javen Coleman on the bump for LSU. It will be for Coleman, excuse me, it'll be for Coleman uh, appearance number five, start number three. He's 2-0 and on the year. With an ERA of 2.84, you're looking at 12 and two-thirds innings pitched for Coleman. Eight walks, 16 punch outs. The opponent hitting just 122 off of the Tiger lefty. He was sensational in his last appearance. That was in relief against um, against North Dakota State in that uh, final game of the three-game set there on that Wednesday. And, I mean, he was, or excuse me, it was in relief of game number one, the Tuesday game against North Dakota State. Uh, went three shutout, struck out uh, five, and he was he was awesome. It was arguably the best Javen Coleman has looked all year. Really had a great feel for his slider. The fastball was up to 95 multiple times. So you want to see him just continue to do that. You want to see him get LSU off to a nice start. I don't expect him to let Coleman go all too deep. In this ball game, he's there to get you off to the nice start because in a perfect world, you will use him this weekend against Florida. Um, so you don't want him burning himself up in a midweek game against La Tech. For the Bulldogs, on the other side of this thing, that is going to be uh, junior left-handed, junior left-hander, excuse me, Caden Copeland. Looking at Copeland, this will be appearance number seven, start number five. He is three and one on the year with an ERA of 4.08, 17 and two-thirds innings pitched, 
six walks, 18 strikeouts for Copeland, and the opponent hits 261 off of the Bulldog lefty. It's been an interesting season for him so far. Got off to a really fast start. Uh, the ERA is a little elevated because of his last outing. Started a game against ULL in the midweek and only went two and a third, gave up six earned runs in that game. That is by far the most earned runs he has given up, and that, that has elevated it. In his previous, let's see, his previous five outings, just two earned runs before the one against ULL. So the Cajuns were able to get to him. LSU, they took some strides offensively over the weekend against Mississippi State. They were far from perfect, but they took some strides. We talked about that in the recap. Can they continue to do that? This is a guy coming off a rough outing. You should have opportunity there. All right. We're going to come back to the pitching staff because right off the top of the show, I said this is the perfect opponent for LSU to face coming off the weekend they're coming off of. And you might ask, why is that? Here's why. What was the reason LSU lost the series to Mississippi State? What was it? It was pitching and defense. When I look at this ULL batting order, excuse me, not ULL, this La Tech batting order, you are going to see arguably the most veteran lineup you will all year. Arguably. At any point, at any point, this team could have eight seniors, eight seniors in the lineup. You're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six guys over 300 and another one right on the doorstep at 296. You're looking at a very deep team that's hitting 309 as a group. They average a home run per game. They've also pounded out 52 doubles so far in 21 games. They can slug it, and they can run a little bit on the base paths, especially a guy like Dalton Davis, who is 7 for 7 in stolen bases as a team. They're 20 of 24. All that to be said, they're veteran. They hit for a high average. They're aggressive on the base paths. They have struck out just 130 times in 745 at-bats. That's 17% of the time. That's a really good ratio. So run through it again. They hit for a high average. They can slug. They don't strike out, so they're putting the ball in play. They're aggressive on the base pass. They put pressure on your pitching staff and your defense. And if you're LSU and you're coming off the weekend that you are where you were bad, like you were bad. I think in the recap, we labeled it a total failure. You were bad. You give up 33 runs on 41 hits. That's the only way I can really describe it is total failure. Give me this team coming in next. The team that's actually going to challenge you and you're going to learn a little bit if the work you've done in the couple days leading up to this game has taken. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that LSU is going to use their top flight arms. They probably won't. But what you can look at is how they manage this game from a pitching standpoint. And you can start to learn. Look, if LSU goes out there and throws, you know, a, a four-hit shutout or whatever against, you, against La Tech, that's going to be great. It's not going to tell you everything's solved. It'll be great if LSU goes out there and gives up, you know, eight runs on 13 hits. It's not going to tell you everything's still awful. Like, we're not we're not deciding the fate of this team or this pitching staff off this one game, but it is one hell of a test. And you will be able to see if they're managing things at least a little differently. One thing that stuck out to me in that Mississippi State series, and we, we mentioned it on the recap about how they handled the bullpen was odd. It, it wasn't you know, conventional to what I to what I think many of us thought they would. And it's not just because of the guys they brought in. Like, it's not just because you saw Nate Ackenhausen one time, right? That's, that's not totally what I mean. 
It's not just because Fidel Uyoa threw two pitches over the entire weekend and you've been using him in leverage spots all pre-conference. That's not totally what we mean. One thing you saw from LSU, and I understand when you get to conference play, you have to pare down the roster and all that is understood. But throughout pre-conference play, you saw quick hook. Like if there is sign of trouble outside of your starters most of the time, they weren't waiting around. They were getting another arm out of the bullpen because they had the depth. They didn't do that. Like they, they LSU didn't do that in uh in, in Starkville. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, in, in, at certain points the game got away from you. Like on Friday night, the game got away from you a little bit. But I mean. Uh, you know, look, Kate, Kate Anderson, uh, I mean, you could say that's it's quick, but, you know, he faced five batters and four of them reached, but he was out still in there out facing five batters. You, you get my, my drift. Like, man, when the first two reach and you're in a tight game and they're clawing at you, you can go away from them. You could very well be in a situation like that Tuesday night against Louisiana Tech. So I want to see how LSU handles that. That's something that I absolutely want to watch. But this is the team I want you to have to face. When you're coming off that weekend, I don't need you bringing in, you know, and it's it's great that the schedule lined up this way, but I don't need you bringing in, you know, the midweek opponent that's hitting 235 as a team and strikes out in, you know, two-thirds of their ABs. That's not going to tell you anything. While we won't solve the whole problem or all the issues with LSU's pitching staff right now in this game against Louisiana Tech, it's still going to give you a really good gauge because this is this is a formidable task that you're going to face. Let's go through some of the guys that you'll see. Uh, it's going to start with Ethan Bates, and this is not the only time we're going to re- uh, mention him because he's a two-way guy and he's dynamite on the mound as well. He has started all 21 games. For La Tech, he's hitting 391, which leads the team. He leads the team in doubles with 11. He is second on the team in home runs with four and leads the team in RBI with 32. So a leader in average, a leader in doubles, a leader in RBI. You circle Ethan Bates, veteran guy, senior. You don't want to let him beat you. That's the first guy you're going to circle. Cole McConnell is next on the team in... uh. In batting average, he is second on the, excuse me, he is, uh, no, yes, he's second on the team in doubles. He leads the team in home runs, and he's second on the team in RBI. You guessed it, another senior. So you're not going to want him to beat you. We mentioned Dalton Davis and his prowess on the base paths, already going seven for seven. He's also the third leading RBI guy and hits 372 and is tied for second on the team with home runs, another senior. This should be a real familiar name to everybody, Caston Fur, because I'm pretty sure Caston Fur has been at Louisiana Tech since I was in diapers, and he's off to another great start. All 21 uh, games he's played and started in. Y'all remember George Corona? You should, because while he's up over 300 yet again this season, you go back to a few years prior. And he was the bat you circled in this Louisiana Tech lineup that you're like, okay, that guy absolutely, you know, just can't let him uh, take you down. I mean, look at this. And, and, uh, you know, you're looking at a guy in 2022 had 16 homers and 62 RBI. So he's in his fifth year now. He's back. So, I mean, you got plenty of guys, plenty of guys to keep an eye on in that La Tech lineup. That's just a few of them. We could have kept going. We didn't even mention Michael Ballard, who's hitting 342. So, this is going to be a great test for LSU's pitching staff, and I can't wait to see it. Now, you want to flip. You want to flip things and LSU's defense because of how much they put the ball in play and the pressure they're going to put you put on you at the baseball on on the on the base paths. I mean, all the problems you had, all the problems you had against Mississippi State can absolutely rear their ugly head again in this game against La Tech if you haven't taken 
just the slightest steps to fixing them. So I am incredibly intrigued uh, to watch this game. On the other side, for La Tech, pitching the ball, they're more than steady, man. They've got their group of guys that they really rely on, and all of them have been very, very, very good. And guess what? It starts again with Ethan Bates. He's going to throw from the right side. They use him at the back end of their bullpen. Nine appearances that ties him for the lead uh, for the lead on the team, but he does lead the team with five saves. Uh, a 0.63 ERA for Ethan Bates to go along with five saves and 14 and a third innings of work. So you're, you're looking at a guy who they could stretch out a little bit as well. Like, I mean, his longest outing on the year is two innings, so not a not a stranger to, like, a two-inning save um, there. He can put the ball past you, 20 strikeouts in, in 14 innings. The opponent is hitting 087 against Ethan Bates. So, like I said, this could very well be a close game. If it is, Ethan Bates is coming in to finish it. So, you'll deal with him in the lineup, and you very well could deal with him on the mound as well you have a trio of right-handed relievers nate Kreider, uh grant hubka and sam sam broderson all three of them eight appearances on the year you got you look at uh broderson and hubka they can definitely extend a little bit more i mean broderson has 16 innings uh in those eight appearances hubka's got 15 and a third Kreider's an inning inning per outing guy but all of them have been very, very uh, effective. You look at Broderson, 31 strikeouts in those 16 innings. It is a nice arm from, from that guy, uh, and the opponent hits just 132. Grant Hubka, 19 punch outs and 15 in the third, 196 batting average against. None of them have an ERA uh, higher than 3-4. They're all below that, and Kreider and Hubka are both sub-3 ERAs. Those are guys you can absolutely count on seeing in this game more often than not. Ryan Harland is the other guy with nine appearances uh, on the on the season. Numbers there, uh, a bit more interesting. The ERA is a little elevated. Looking at the rest of his numbers, I would tell you it's based off of one outing, and it is. Against Southern Miss, he gave up five earned and two-thirds of an inning. Outside of that, one run. That's it. He's been very good outside of that one outing, and they've used him plenty. They've used him plenty. So that's another guy to keep an eye on right there. Uh, I mean, there we just went through. And then, I mean, we could, we could honestly throw in uh, Jacob Havern, uh, as well, out of their bullpen. Elevated ERA, but the appearances are plentiful. He's made seven appearances so far on the season for La Tech. When I look at LSU offensively in this game, going up against this staff, which I think is a great test as well, I just want to see them continue the progression. Like, I, I know so many of you get frustrated with LSU's offense right now in the lineup, and I, I get it. Um, but... I will still continue to sit here and tell you they're on track. Like, they are doing what we want them to do. They're, they are progressing. It was just exacerbated because you were so bad on the mound in the field. You, what's supposed to carry you, lets you down. And, you know, it's hard to see the progress with the offense when that happens. Um, but, I mean, like, I want Tommy White to stay hot. I want Michael Braswell. To continue, Michael Braswell was your leading hitter against Mississippi State. He hit 400. Like, yes, please continue that track. Josh Pearson had a really good weekend. I want to see him continue to follow that up. And then you, you know, you get everybody else in there. Like, can you continue to find length in the lineup? That's what you're after. Can Mac Bingham become a little bit more consistent at the plate and help lengthen your lineup? Can Steven Milam get back on track and lengthen that lineup? Hayden Dravinsky and Jared Jones, they've both been pretty darn consistent so far throughout the season. I mean, you got Jared Jones hitting 294, Dravinsky hitting 319. If they can continue that track, that's just going to continue to provide length in your lineup. That's what you're after right now if you're LSU. So 
the guys who really succeeded, who, who really started to take a step forward against Mississippi State, I want to see them continue, uh, and they'll do it, have to do it against what looks like a pretty challenging uh, Louisiana Tech lineup. So all that, man, I'm just going to continue to tell you that that's that's a positive for the offense to continue to progress, and it's a positive that you have a team like this coming in for them to do it against after the weekend that this whole team had. So I, I'm looking forward. I'm very, very much looking forward to this one between LSU and uh, and Louisiana Tech. The other thing I'm really interested in is I want to see if Paxton Kling is back in the lineup. Um, the the offense hasn't been great, obviously, for Paxton Kling. The defense has. Will Jay sacrifice? I, I'm. You can probably tell with the commentary we've had on Paxton Kling on this show. I was expecting a much longer leash. He had two days off against State. I want to see if they throw him back out there now because he's he's going to be a big part of this team. And I do believe for LSU to get where they want to go, he needs to be a big part of this team. He's had a couple days off. He's he's you know got to take the game in from a different angle. Now do you throw him back out there in the midweek, but against a formidable opponent to see if he can't start getting go get going. Uh, as you as you you know progress throughout the year and in, in an SEC play, that's something else. I uh, I'll be very interested to see in the uh, in the lineup on the on the lineup card. I should say. One more thing for pitching, uh, I'm hopeful that we see some of your your best guys, especially some guys who maybe struggled a little bit over the weekend, uh, get them back out there. Uh, you know, a guy like a Justin Lore, as you continue to search for consistency there with him, I would like to see Fidel Yoa get some work considering he only threw two pitches. Um, maybe Christian Little, he, you know, had to leave with a pretty sour taste in his mouth. Jay Johnson mentioned Micah Bucknam. Um, mentioned Micah Bucknam. Uh, in his in his Monday press conference, as somebody they're hopeful to get on the mound against Louisiana Tech. So I'm, sh- I mean, give me all those guys. I, I, I'd, I'd like to see Cam Johnson and uh, Aiden Moffitt. Like if LSU wanted, if LSU wanted to in this game, I would not be opposed to like the old strategy that Paul Maneri used to always, uh, you know, uh, put into play in the midweek games. Throw nine guys, just a guy in any, like. I, I want to see as many guys as you could fit into this game because it's your only midweek game and you need to get work. You need to get some of these guys work and you need to to get everybody on this staff confident again. Like all of them because it was it was just that hard over the weekend that I want all of them back out there. So like I don't know if Jay Johnson's going to do that. I would not be opposed to that. Uh but that that is something I want to see how they how, how they structure how they use the guys uh, not necessarily in the roles just wh- how how many guys they can get back out there so uh, that's going to be huge. One final thing to pass on uh, an update on Ethan Fry. Jay Johnson was asked about Fry and his recovery from that shoulder injury he suffered against Xavier uh, at his Monday press conference. This was your latest update on Ethan Fry. He hit uh, batting practice on Saturday and Sunday, and we're, we're hey, out of one out of 10, 10 being the best you ever felt in your life. You know, where are you? We're, we're creeping to the, the upper half of, of the scale. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. But a um, guy I'd like to get in there, you know, in, in terms of what you were just talking about, Michael, with the outfield situation, you know, his availability a week, two weeks, I'm not, not quite sure yet. So there you go. It could be a week, could be two weeks. Don't know. He's swinging the bat again. That's a great sign. I, I'm ready. To, I as the quickest he can get back. I'm all for it, y'all. If you've been listening to this throughout the year, you know in the preseason, I tabbed Ethan Fry as a guy that I said, man, don't be surprised if you look up in the middle of SEC play and that guy's starting to emerge and becoming a force in this lineup. He hits the cover off the baseball. He has a good understanding of what they want to do at the plate, which is huge and. You, you can you know you can stick him out there in the outfield uh, and and let him you know try to go run it down and when you've had so much uncertainty that you're playing a catcher out there in Brady Neal to get bat his bat in the lineup you know I mean you're so unsettled there still a guy like Ethan Fry making a return is going to be welcomed so uh, don't know exactly Jay said could be a week could be two 
but he's taking batting practice again, and and that's huge. So the sooner you can get Ethan Fry back, the sooner he's ready, he's going to get a chance to be in there. I 100% believe that. And what I will also say, though, is you're going to have to be patient when he does get back in there. He's not just going to come in and, and probably hit the cover off the ball and start, you know, lining doubles in the gap. It's going to take him a while to get acclimated to live pitching again, uh, most likely when he comes back. Think Tommy White last year. It took Tommy a little bit uh, after that injury. So uh, it, it might take him a few games, but when he's ready, I very firmly believe they're going to have him in the lineup. All right. That's all I got for you today. Uh, prediction, I think LSU bounces back. Uh, they they haven't lost back-to-back games yet this season. Um, they've been pretty good at bouncing back, so I, I will take them in a close game. I think Louisiana Tech's going to come in and play, um, play very inspired baseball and give LSU all they want. So I'm expecting a close win. Uh, for LSU on Tuesday night against La Tech. You know we'll have a full recap for you on Moose with the Box, so be on the lookout for that. Smash the like button. Get subscribed up to the YouTube channel. Get subscribed up to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. You can follow me on the various social medias as well. Appreciate all of you for listening, and be here next time on Muso at the Box.